Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 136, The Battle of Borodino. Last week, we covered the big three generals of the Napoleonic War, Pyotr Bagrachon, Mikhail Andreas Barclay de Tolly, and Mikhail Kutuzov. Today, I want to review the Battle of Borodino, where all three men led troops that would eventually bring a halt to Napoleon's invasion of Russia. As with any battle of the magnitude of Borodino, it is difficult, to say the least, to get an unbiased account of what went on. Not only do the opposing sides disagree on what happened, infighting amongst the generals on both sides lead to confusing accounts. I, as usual, will try to do my best to try to weed out the bias and provide an objective tale of the events of that important day. When Napoleon invaded Russia on June 16, 1812, he had one thing on his mind, engage the Russians in one decisive battle, crush them and force them to the peace table, and make them cease all trade with the British. With the Russians out of the way, the French could turn westward and finish the Peninsular War in Spain and Portugal and defeat the British. He knew a two-front war was unwinnable and he needed to knock the Russians out. At the beginning of the invasion, Tsar Alexander I and German general Karl Ludwig von Fuhl, who was in the service of the emperor, decided that the Russians must face off against Napoleon in a decisive battle after he invaded on June 16th. They believed it would be in the area of Vilnius. Both Bagrachon and Barclay de Tolly would lead the Russians against the French. The plan would prove to be an utter folly as the army they were up against outnumbered the Russians more than three to one, and in some estimates it was five to one. It would have ended the war right then and there. They smartly decided to fall back instead. Napoleon rushed into Russia hoping to catch his opponent in an open area and crush them in one battle and force them to negotiate a peace. De Tolly thought otherwise and decided to carry out a scorched earth strategy, denying the French any forage. This was terribly unpopular with the Russian people as well as with Tsar Alexander. When the French crossed the Niemen River, they had 280,000 men directly under Napoleon, but when they arrived at the Battle of Borodino, they numbered only 160,000. Most of the men who died died of starvation or disease, and it was only going to get worse. Even though it looked like a fool's march, Napoleon was sure that a decisive battle would win the day. Still, the Russian people were frustrated and were demanding that the army make a stand. They also, as I mentioned in the last podcast, distru really distrusted Barclay de Tolly. So Alexander made the decision to entrust the campaign to the Russian Kutuzov. The field marshal agreed with Barclay regarding the scorched earth tactics, but he knew a battle had to be fought outside of Moscow. The troops' morale was getting worse by the day, as they saw their homeland being burned to the ground. Kutuzov decided that he would continue to harass the French, but would add a strong rearguard defense to slow them down. He was looking for the right place to stage a major battle. The place he chose, of course, was Borodino. Now, if you look at a map of the topography of the area, you might be a little surprised by the selection, as there were no natural defensive positions, as it was basically a large open field. But there was the Kolocha River, which protected the Russian army's right flank. Instead of using nature's defense, Kutuzov has, had his engineers build him some. On September 3rd, he began the building of two earthworks, the first being the Ryevsky Redoubt in the center right, and the three open arrow-shaped Bagrachon fletches on the left. One of the main problems facing the Russians was constant bickering amongst the field generals. Because of this, they soon realized that their left flank was terribly vulnerable and exposed. When Napoleon arrived, they pulled back their men behind the fletches, but left the redoubts manned with artillery and men. And I just want to add something else. From what I understand, even in Napoleon's court, there was a lot of bickering and arguing amongst all the generals. So... We now have the Battle of Chevrodino, which started on September 5th, as a prelude to the Battle of Borodino. The French, led by Marat, and the Russians, led by Konovintsyan, 
fought fiercely with four to 5,000 French and 6,000 Russian casualties being suffered on the field. This was not a good turnout for either side, but the French could really ill afford to lose any more men as they had no real reserves and the Russians had lots. A war of attrition, of course, was much easier for the home team to absorb. By the end of the day, the Russians succeed, or the French, excuse me, succeeded in capturing the redoubts and caused the Russians to retreat. The retreat, though, was not because the soldiers and commanders wanted to, but that Kutuzov ordered them to as the men wanted to continue fighting. So now we have the forces of the French, numbering about 128,000, with 18,500 troops of the Imperial Guard held in reserve. The Russians had 155,000 men, with 10,000 Cossacks and 33,000 militiamen held in reserve. And I want you to understand something about this war and this battle. When you look at the numbers from different historians, it, it is so widely varied as to how many men were really there. Uh, it's, it can vary by about as much as 50% from the top to the bottom. So these are rough estimates. Now, Kutuzov also held back 300 pieces of artillery, leaving only 337 pieces on the field of battle. Now, there's some argument that the field marshal held back so many in case of a rout, or he mismanaged the setup, but I think that it is likely that he wisely held them back to protect his troops, and knowing that if he inflicted enough damage to the French, they would be finished, without having to risk losing the pieces of artillery and the men in reserve. So, when the battle began at 6 a.m. on September 7th, 1812, the Russian right, led by Dottoli, was so powerfully formed that it looked like it was virtually unassailable and manned by 80,000 soldiers. The left, under Bagrachon, was weak with about 34,000 men. From here we see the older and sickly Napoleon making errors that the younger Napoleon would never have done. Despite Marshal DeVoe's suggestion that the French immediately attack the weak left, Napoleon had DeVoe go to the right, directly into the heart of the Russian army. The V Corps, led by Polish Prince Poniatowski, was given the task of attacking the left, and his army and his corps was considered pretty weak. The French battered the center lines of the Russians with their 102 cannons, which led DeVoe to send in two divisions into the battle of militiamen. The Russians responded with a withering artillery barrage of their own. Back and forth they went, with Bagrachon mortally wounded around 9.30 a.m. To read the accounts of the fighting is to be amazed at the bravery of the men on both sides. Now, Napoleon was not near the field of battle that day, in the beginning, as he was fighting a cold, but when told of the battle, refused to commit his reserve troops, the Imperial Guard. This single decision, which he did a few times during that day, was to haunt Napoleon, because it could have led to a decisive victory, the one that he wanted. Now, I could go on about you know how the battle unfolded and the different you know charges and things like that, but that's not what I really wanted to focus on. One of the things I found unusual is that Kutuzov was almost totally out of it that day. As Colonel Karl van Clauswitz said of the field marshal, quote, he seemed to be in a trance. Now, the other side, it was, a, it was hell out there. And what Dottoli said of his men marching into battle, it was like, quote, a walk into hell. Napoleon, for his part, made mistakes, especially when it came to making timely decisions, which went against his number one military principle of, quote, ground I may recover, time never. The confusion on the battlefield played into the hands of the Russians as they were playing a defensive game. But the truth was, both sides were losing men and leaders throughout the day. By 3 p.m., the Russian army was in dire straits, but the French army was totally exhausted. It was at this time that Napoleon made one of his most critical mistakes, according to some. His generals begged him to finally commit the Imperial Guard and deal the blow needed to finish the Russians. General Rapp, a senior aide-de-camp to the emperor, told him that now was the time to send in the fresh troops. Napoleon replied, quote, I will most definitely not. I do not want to have it blown up. I am certain of winning the battle without its intervention, 
Instead, he ordered 400 artillery pieces to fire upon the Russians. Here we see Kutuzov misplacing a large number of Russian troops, which could have crushed the French army, but there is evidence that he did so on purpose. He had fought the good fight, and he still had a large part of his army intact. Kutuzov ordered a retreat past Moscow, abandoning the ancient capital and heading to Semolino. Napoleon had won the day, but it was considered a pyrrhic or hollow one, and not the total one he had hoped for. His French army had lost around 34 to 35,000 men, depending again on the sources, with about 1,928 officers dead. That much we do know. It was the last offensive battle that Napoleon would fight on Russian soil. The Russians lost 52,000 men to death or injury, including Bagration, but they were in their homeland and could resupply their army with more men and food. To better understand the carnage at the Battle of Borodino, we go to historian Gwyn Dyer, saying it was like, quote, a fully loaded 747 crashing with no survivors every five minutes for eight hours. It was the worst single day of loss of life during the entire Napoleonic conflicts. Waterloo would have 55,000 dead versus over 65,000 at Borodino. Leo Tolstoy, in his epic book, War and Peace, would say the battle as, quote, a continuous slaughter, which could be of no avail either to the French or the Russians. To the Russian people, it is a battle of pride for their country. To the men who lost their lives that day to save their country, they will never be forgotten. The same as the men who fought against the invading Germans in 1941 through 45. There are a number of different statues, memorials. They still do uh, the battle reenactments uh, every year at the field in Borodino on September 7th. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as I cover a brief history of the country of Belarus. So thanks for listening. Thanks to all the listeners for their generous donations to the podcast last week. It really does help. I mean, the podcast does cost, you know, in just hosting it quite a bit because it has so many of the uh, podcast uh, episodes still online, and I want to really keep them there for years to come. Uh, I'd also like to thank one person, uh, listener Max, who uh, emailed me today, and he grew up in Russia in St. Petersburg and offered to help me with one thing that I really have the problem, pronouncing the tongue-twisting Russian words that I've botched up over and over again over the years. Max, it's much appreciated, and I guarantee you I will avail myself of your help. Uh, please visit the blog site at RussianRulersHistory.com, and don't forget to visit us on Facebook at Russian Rulers History Podcast, where you can ask a question, leave a comment, make a suggestion, or occasionally participate in a poll. So now, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.